Welcome to Ira's Everything Bagel, where I talk with intriguing people about everything, their passions, pursuits, and points of view. Can love between two people survive the onslaught of chronic illness? Do all of us take health for granted? Well, writer Sarah Cart shares how she became one of 39 million Americans taking care of an ailing loved one in her book. She's the author, along with Glenn Plaskin, of On My Way Back to You, One Couple's Journey Through Catastrophic Illness to Healing and Hope. It's available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, in all the usual places. For everything about Sarah Cart, you can go to, and I hate to do this, folks, www, she told me to do that, onmywaybacktoyou.com, and she can explain why we did that. So the three W's and onmywaybacktoyou.com. And Sarah, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ira. It's a pleasure to be here. Appreciate your talking with me today. Absolutely. Given all you've been through, and you can discuss it with us in a moment, but I wanted to know why you decided to write a book about the subject. It probably wasn't easy given what you went through, and now you're writing, you've written a book about it. So what 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 was the motivation for writing the book? Um, writing On My Way Back to You was a way to process everything that my husband, Ben, and I had gone through um, as his incurable autoimmune disease went totally out of control and nearly killed him. Um, it's a life and death love story. Um, everybody could see that Ben was dying and I found myself on a really steep learning curve as his caregiver. It was terrifyingly intense, um, but then miraculously in the midst of COVID, we got an unexpected gift that enabled our happy ending. And after all of that, there's a little bit of PTSD. So writing was the way I worked through that. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting reason to write it, to, as you say, process what went on. How, over how much time did you have to deal and how much, much time did Ben have to deal with all of this? His autoimmune um, disorder was diagnosed in January of 2017, and he got his heart transplant in April of 2020 in the middle of COVID. Um, but that's not really an accurate window because his autoimmune, we caught it really early and it was it happened to be blood, blood work that showed it as opposed to a whole lot of symptoms. So we were very much like, really? He has to take all this medication for something that's not really doing anything. It's just a weird number. Um, but a year and a half, well, that first summer, so six months after his diagnosis, he dropped about 30 pounds without really trying. And the following summer, is when it got a little intense. That's when he was diagnosed with congestive heart failure as the autoimmune disease worked its way from organ to organ and diagnosis to diagnosis. So that's when I really started journaling, um, just trying to get through my days. So even then you were writing? Yeah, I've always, I've always written. My parents were both in the publishing world. And so writing is, but never like this, not for therapeutic reasons. Right. Um, this is where it really took flight. But I would imagine writing the book was eased by the fact that you had been journaling, as you call it. So you had you had material you can go back to because trying to remember all of this would be hard. And so you're able to look back to your notes and say, oh, yes. And then you could expand on that in the book. Yeah, I had I had multiple sources of notes because as Ben was getting sicker, I was his medical secretary. So I had all of those notes from every doctor's appointment and I had my journaling and I also when he finally um, ended up in the hospital two weeks after the COVID pandemic was declared, um, the way that I kept close family and friends on the same page was by sending out regular emails. Um, and so those, those emails actually were the first outline of the book. This book is not just uh, your story about what you went through and what Ben went through, but it's also a sense of hope for potential caregivers. And there's a quote of yours that I, I want to share with our audience, which is there is certainly no promise that the health we enjoy this evening will be with us in the morning. And I have to tell you, that's a very solid, practical observation. And it's profound at the same time, because we all take for granted our health. And we bitch and moan about the little things in life that irritate us. But if you don't have your health, I, I hate to sound like I'm spouting a cliche, but if you don't have your health, you don't have anything. Absolutely. And I just in the in the years since Ben was diagnosed, you become so much more conscious. We have both of us of how 
true that is, how many people we know for whom that is the, the truth of everything is fine one day and the next day you might as well have been hit by a bus. Um, yeah. Yeah. Every, the whole world is turned upside down. And that's before the pandemic. I mean, that's just... Oh, the icing on the cake there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Bad, bad <laughs> icing on the cake, but... Yeah. Uh, but in that case, so. did, did you have in your mind, and this is not for everybody because you, have, you and Ben have a unique story, but did you have a sufficient support base around you or a support group around you that helped you deal with it as a caregiver and for Ben to deal with it, what, what he was going through? We have um, a close core of friends that we communicate with, you know, long before this, that we communicate with on a regular basis. And they, even though it was COVID and they were scattered all across the country, um, they were fabulous. One woman would send me um, blondie brownies, the, the butterscotch kind of brownies, and she'd put them in a plastic bag that she would, across the top of which she would write for medicinal purposes only. Um, <laughs> you know, just that kind. And at Easter time, um, the other two wives sent me Easter candy. One sent me an Easter basket and the other one sent me some really expensive chocolates from New York. Um, so, and our family was, our, our sons were awesome about tag teaming with each other about who's spoken with mom lately or did you get that weird phone call from dad at 6.30 this morning? He called me asking if how things are in my bunker. Did you get a phone call from him about that kind of mm -hmm. thing? And so it's amazing to me to think that the first Zoom call I was ever a part of was the night Ben went into the hospital. And now it's such a daily part of my life. Um, it, it, it was it was a, a godsend to be able to connect with people that way. Absolutely. And we also had, yeah, we had neighbors and friends who... Um, I didn't want to see anybody because I kept hoping the hospital would ch drop their protocol about not being able to visit because of COVID. Right. Um, so people would just drop food or flowers or a little watercolor or notes by our front door. So I, I was really supported by the neighborhood. And because we live in Florida, I could go for distance walks with people. They'd, they'd knock on the door and say, hey, I'm getting you out of the house. You can't just stare at the computer or be waiting right. for the phone to ring. Exactly. So, what, did you also get help? And this is that part two of this question in a sense. You did have a great support group in a virtual sense because it was during COVID. But were people able to spell you once you are dealing with Ben um, from the hospital? In other words, or were you on your own at that point? I was, I was a little bit more on my own than we expected I would be. Um, we were supposed to have home health care come in on a regular basis and change. He came home with five dressings. Um, and I'm, I'm an English major. I don't do blood. Um, yeah. I'm with you. Stuff. I'm with you on that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not but, the English um, part, but the blood part. Yeah. Yeah. The, <laughs> um, the home health care kind of um, it, it didn't fall into place easily, partly because of COVID partly because mm -hmm. we don't live um, in a convenient area. Right. Uh, so that was, that proved very challenging. Um, but I, I pulled myself up by my bootstraps. He came home with a, he came home with a broken hip, um, and an amazing bed sore. And the bed sore had to heal enough for them to do the hip surgery. So that was my challenge: was to get around. Okay, home healthcare is not going to do this. I need, I need to figure out how to do okay. this. Um, did Did you ever think, based on as you're explaining it now and in the book? Did you ever think this is a never ending process here? Is there ever going to be light at the end of the tunnel to use another cliche? Yeah, I tried not to go there. Um, I really, when I had the luxury of taking things week by week, I would take them week by week. Sometimes I had to take them day by day. And there were definitely times when I had to take things hour by hour, but it was, um, you know, if I felt the need to cry, for example, and I didn't have time for it right now, I would promise myself you can cry yourself to sleep tonight, but right now you've got to do this over here, solve this problem, or at least try to move the ball forward over here. Um, it, it was, it was exhausting, but you know, I didn't have a choice. I wanted him to survive. So it was me. Not just survive, but live. Yeah. Yes. I, in, live. In, a large, in, in a larger sense, meaning not yes. just laying there, but yeah. 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 
how important because you mentioned your friend who I <laughs> like about gave you the cookies with for medicinal purposes only. How important was humor in helping you cope during this time? Oh, vital. Um, you know, I, when I was on my own, uh, there were times when I would just pull up YouTube videos, something to make me laugh, anything to make me laugh. Um, or, you know, old television reruns. I, it just, they were my sort of go-to drug. Um, mm -hmm. a well-written, a, a well-written comedy is a, is a, is a joy to have. I don't know how many times I watched Love Actually, probably 40. <laughs> um that, that kind of thing was just and it was good to have um the old favorites that i could go back to um, did you ever very, feel you were you were getting into dark humor territory too just because of the the nature of what would you, what you were dealing with um i didn't go there no um I, I tried to keep it light um i tried to not give oxygen to the bad stuff mm -hmm. and and so dark humor might have taken me down that path and i didn't want to do that did you ever get a chance to get some, uh, you were mentioning about seeing a movie that many times or, or looking for stuff on YouTube. Did you ever get a chance to come across, and I know with all the stress, which has got to take its toll, but with all the stress of dealing with this on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis, did you ever have a comedy that, were able, that you were able to have a belly laugh about as opposed to just chuckling? Um, it's releasing the endorphins, and I'm just curious. Yeah, can, 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 I name, can I name a favorite TV show? Absolutely. Big Bang Theory gets me every time. I just I I have a thing for Big Bang Theory. <laughs> My wife watches that. I have I've not seen one episode yet, but I probably should. But yes, it's yeah. Okay, that's good. That's good to know. When you were just back to the health for a second, because that really is important. I think it's one of the important points that you want to make. We just go through our lives and we don't think about health unless something happens and it could it's not necessarily an illness but it could be a broken arm you trip and fall or something like that but it does take you out of your comfort zone and remind you that we're all mortal and going through these health issues with your husband ben do you find that you have a larger appreciation of life in general absolutely um you asked about humor earlier mm -hmm. when we get into um, exchanging words on occasion now it's often humor that brings us out of it more quickly than it ever did before we we have we're, we've been blessed to be best friends since we were teenagers and that part's great but when you get into the um you know he asks a question and my answer is fine and and he knows that that's probably not the right answer <laughs> um because he had, because he came home with a broken hip and he had to learn to walk again and he had to learn to do stairs again. When we're going at it, sometimes he'll just, he'll walk over to the stairs and he'll, to take the pressure off of the situation, he'll walk over and he'll step up one step at a time and go, look at me doing reciprocal steps. And <laughs> we have to laugh because the day he came home from physical therapy, able to do reciprocal steps again for the first time in six months was, was a miraculous day. And you just, you just realize how unimportant so many of the things that we snip at each other for. But I think just, that I think that's pretty really. normal for people that even under under any occasion, if you're a married couple or just living together for a long period of time, it's human nature to be snipping at each other. It just the way yeah. it is. Yeah. Yeah. The outside world would think that you you could never get along, but it actually that's just part of the 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 package. Well, I and mean, you asked earlier too about dark humor. We do have a dark humor way of behaving with each ah, other. Ah, now out, you're confessing. Out in public. Okay, um, there we go. Tell me about it. <laughs> we'll be out somewhere, and and maybe we've just run into each other during errands. Um, you know, he's going one way, and I'm going the other, and I'll I'll turn to him and say, "Okay, I'm leaving you." And people who don't know us are like, "Oh my goodness, this is this is when this is happening after everything they've been through." <laughs> you know, no, I'm leaving him to go home and start making dinner or you know, exactly. whatever. Exactly. Well, but, that's a rather light, dark humor. I, yes. I, I was expecting something even darker the way you were explaining it, but that's oh, great. No, that's oh, about that's as great. dark as we get. Was he aware of the pressures you were under as a caregiver at the time he was going through all this over a long period of time, or was he in such agony, I'll use that term, that he really had to focus on himself? Or was there an appreciation and awareness of what you were doing? He. He definitely 
um, appreciated where I was coming from most of the time um, and, and was really good about, I mean, even um, when, when the diagnosis of congestive heart failure came and we had to really talk through stuff about are you dying? Do we think you're dying? Where do you want your remains to be? Um, he was really focused on um, helping me figure out what it was that frightened me about being alone um, and, and teaching me what I needed to, to know. Everything from the practical stuff like when that light goes on on the dashboard that says check engine, that's the only warning you're going to get. There's not going to be a bell. The the man at the gas station is not going to call you and offer to fix your car. You need to be proactive about that. It was, right. it was everything from that to the, how do you handle the insurance? How do you do the taxes? How, all the, all the um, deep in the weeds stuff at his desk. And, and he'd give me tutorials on those things. He wanted me to be prepared to be on my own. Did, um, did he also, and this is, if it's too personal, let me know, but I, I okay. based on what you were talking about, did he also, because those are very frank discussions, even on a practical level, yeah. uh, in, including, as you say, where do you want to be buried or do you want to be cremated or any of that stuff? Did he also yeah. give you his tacit permission, for want of a better term, that if he were to go, that you could find someone else to live with, to be possibly married to? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. He was, you know, don't, I don't want you to martyr yourself. I don't want you to you know, the best thing you could do is figure out a way to, to move through the rest of your life happy. And if that's being single, that's fine. If that's being married, that's fine too. And we had um, a wonderful example of that. My father, um, my father had nursed my mother to her death when he was about my age. And so he was a fabulous support through everything I was going through. And after my mom died, my dad got remarried to one of her friends who had lost her husband five months before mom and dad and Carol were married for 34 years and their motto was keep having fun. And it's one thing when you first hear that when you're 30, it's another thing when you're in your early sixties and you think, wow, I get it now. They both mm -hmm. nursed their loved ones to horrible ends, um, but found happiness again and found fun again. And made a point of having that be their focus. So we had that example. Yeah, that's great. Did yeah. you, when you finished the book, did you share it with Ben? I did. It's one of those things where the manuscript sat um, on the dining room table for, oh, I don't know, weeks, maybe months before he finally could pick it up. And he, he had to take it in small doses at first. Um, mm -hmm. But now you know, now he's like, oh, well, I think this is in this page and he'll flip through and find a reference, you know, something in whatever chapter. Um, so he's he's not quite as familiar with it as I am or as Glenn Plaskin is, but but he knows um, he can find his way through it, which is great. Glenn, you're a co-author or helped you put the book together, yes. That's what he specializes yeah. in. I know I've had guests on that work with Glenn uh, in that role. Did he feel at all, and again, this is a personal question in a way, but it's it's a legitimate one, did he feel that you were in some cases, it's your story, it's your notes, it's your journals, it's your processing so that you could get mm -hmm. make sense of all this. Did he feel that at some point in the book that you were a little bit too personal with his story, meaning that were you invading his privacy because you were sharing your story, but it was about also him? No, he was very, he has been all the way through very supportive of this is the, the, this is a healing process for you. I was the patient who needed healing back in 2020 and 2021 and well, and before, um, but you're the one who needs healing now. You're the one who went through the trauma. Um, a lot of it, he doesn't remember because of the drugs or sure. because of how sick he was. And so he's, He's really been wonderfully supportive of you do what you need to do now for you, which is incredibly generous of him. And because, really you know, because of the fact that you were, you were really close friends from the very beginning, early in, in your lives, do you find that going through that experience, and I know this may be a little bit of a cliche, but going through the experience that you did and going through the experience that Ben did, the two of you, I would imagine, are even closer than you were anywhere else in all the we, we 
Yeah, we are. And, I, and I'm watching that happen to friends now. Um, as, as one of them gets sicker and the other one becomes the caregiver, it's, it's, you don't realize until you're in the thick of it, that it really does bring you closer together. It, it might be your last months together. I certainly watched my father do this with my mother. Um, mm -hmm. and, but they were the tenderest, kindest months that the two of them had. And, and we, that's the path that we were on. I mean, we knew Ben was dying. Um, and, and everybody could see it. And, um, it really, I didn't want his last months to be him watching me be weepy and, and mm. feeling sorry for myself. I, I really wanted to be strong for him and, and he was being strong for me. It, it did bring us a lot closer. And he, and he also, as you mentioned earlier, he didn't want you to be the weeping widow if in case he did right. pass away. Yeah. He wanted you to live a life. Do you find that your story resonates with people that you have shared it with, those who have read the book or you are aware of your story do you find that it resonates with other people because it's a very human experience yeah i, I am surprised at the people who have said thank you for that i'm i'm, I'm like you know it was my therapy <laughs> you know thank you for reading my therapy um, <laughs> the, the number of people who've said you know, this, this is a great story and you know thank you for sharing it um, one woman in particular said, I really appreciate that you didn't gloss over stuff and make it sound like a fairy tale of, oh, yes, and you got the heart transplant and then everything was perfect because right. it wasn't there. It was a it was a struggle that the transplant surgeon had said on the way into the OR, this is 50 percent of the battle. Getting getting the organ is 50 percent. The other 50 percent is recovery. And mm -hmm. at that point, they didn't know about his broken hip. So that was a whole nother um, element to his recovery that that nobody anticipated. Do you see from your experience, uh, or do you recommend from your experience, anything different that hospitals and doctors or the system, medical system can do? Because it's got to be frustrating when you're trying to organize tests and visits and procedures, et, et cetera. In this case, the heart as well. So is that, from your own experience, well, is there anything that you can recommend to people? Our situation was really um, unique in that most of the worst stuff happened during COVID and I couldn't see him. So the doctors and the nurses and the technicians were all trying to figure out ways to communicate with me, um, you know, to get me to give consent for procedures and things. It, right. was, it all had to be done on the phone. You know, Hi, I'm the radiologist. Here's what we're going to be doing. I have thus and such nurse with me as the witness. Do you consent to this procedure? Um, so they were bending over backwards to make sure that they were communicating with me as best they could when the things were really bad. Right. As Ben started to get better, but was still in the hospital, I heard less and less. And, and, and in those moments, that was tough because I felt like if I were in the room, I could explain to them that, you know, the reason you think his mentation is an issue is because he doesn't have his hearing aids in or his glasses prescription is expired and he can't read what you're giving, you know, the menu that you're giving him um, to have him choose his dinner. Um, so there were gaps like that, but those were COVID related. The The Cleveland Clinic down here in, in Weston, which is right near Fort Lauderdale, um, was amazing. We, we'd been going there throughout his autoimmune issues and um, we had doctors, matched doctors north and south. So the Cleveland Clinic down south was um, where we did all of our Florida stuff. And if you went in there, they they knew we were coming up from the Keys. Um, so we were coming up for long days. They would try to get as many appointments into one day as possible so we wouldn't have to make multiple trips. And if you showed up for a 7 a.m. appointment and then didn't have another appointment until 10, well, if you went to that waiting room, they'd take you as soon as you walked in. So you might have six appointments that the first one is at 7 and the last one's at 2.30, but if you just went from waiting room to waiting room, you could be out of there by 1030 because they they took you in the order in which you arrived. That I've never experienced anyplace else. Um, and his his patchwork of doctors up north were so good about communicating with the clinic. We would be up north for the summer and we'd go see this rheumatologist or we'd go see that cardiologist. And they would they were just really wonderful. There was one doctor up north. The first time we met him, he was looking at Ben's records online. And, and we had done a lot of stuff. We'd gone online and made sure things were up to date. And this doctor says, 
this is this is great. Your records are epic. And Ben and I both thought that that was a compliment to us. But in fact, Epic is a, a program that hospitals use. <laughs> so this doctor was relieved because we use the same program at both hospitals. I'm like, oh, oh, okay. Well, take the win anyway. It's fine. Yes. So. Yeah, we were going for the win wherever we could get it at that point. When, it, when you finished the book, in your mind, what did you want the book to say to people that will read the book, buy the book? Get, sen get a sense of everything you've gone through. Are there two or three key takeaways that you'd like to share with us so people will get a sense of why they should read the book? Uh, one would be there is always something to be thankful for and hope is never wasted. Um, even if Ben had died, I'd like to believe that I would still abide by both of those. Um, another is the phrase, and I'm going to get it wrong, but it's all is well all will be well, you know, just take that to the core of your being, um, that it, you're, you are strong enough for this and, and keep that with you. The last thing is organ donation is a, a miraculous, wonderful gift. We actually just heard of a friend who got a, a, a new heart yesterday. And when Ben walked in to tell me that, we both started crying. I and mean, it's, it's a friend that we've only known on the phone. We knew he was waiting for a heart. Uh, someone else had asked us to please reach out to him, and we did. And um, we're just so happy to to know that he's still on the battlefield. And it is a battlefield. He's still got 50% of the way to go. Right. But the gift of being on the battlefield still. Um, we can never express the depth of our gratitude to the family who, in what has to have been their darkest hours, turned their tragedy into our miracle. And that's also a reminder for people that can do it is to signify on your driver's license that you want to be an organ donor. On your driver's license and talk with your family about it. Um, right. it you know, the, the minutes matter at that point. And yep. if your family is on board with under, understanding what you want, that makes a tremendous difference. Are you satisfied that you processed everything by writing the book? Or do you still think you have a little bit more to do? I, I think what I want to do now is spend some fun time with Ben. So I would say, yeah, I've processed it. Well, that's a great way to leave it. My guest has been Sarah Cart. She is author, along with Glenn Plaskin, of On My Way Back to You, One Couple's Journey Through Catastrophic Illness to Healing and Hope. It's available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all the usual places. And for everything about Sarah Cart, you can go to, and you have to put the three W's in, on my way back to you.com. And Sarah didn't explain why, but she explained it to me. So just put in the three W's and then dot on my on my way back to you.com. Sarah, thanks for being on the show. Ira, thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And join us every Thursday for a new schmear on Ira's Everything Bagel.